I believe through the many weeks that we have going through the laws of God, all of us can sort of see and realize what kind of God uh, we are worshipping. Our God is in fact a very practical and meticulous God. And why do I say so? Because through the laws that he has given us, we can see that God indeed considers a variety of situations in life. And God understands the practical needs of people. So our God is not just a distant God sitting high up there, you know, very detached from real life human issues. God is not like this. Our God is not just a God who is concerned about spiritual stuff, about you know, eternal future, but our God very much is also concerned about how we live our life today. Because from God's commandments, we see that God gives us very, very practical instructions on what? On how to live our life on this earth, on how can we enjoy God's blessings, not only when we go to heaven, but even when we are still living on earth. And God also, through his instructions, God tells us the wisdom on how do we interact, how do we live with people around us, our family members, our neighbors, our fellow men. And also God, in his commandments, God teaches us how to avoid unnecessary troubles and how to not get into suffering and punishments when we do not know the way to please God. And so, as you can see, in the many weeks that we have been going through God's covenant code, we have covered a, a variety of different issues, common human issues, such as what? If you still recall, you know the, I, I know the covenant code is very long, but if you can vaguely remember some of the commandments, what does it involve? It tells us, for example, how do we treat our servants. It talks about how do we deal with intentional and unintentional murder. How do we deal with um, physical injuries that people inflict upon one another. And God's commandment talks about what? Fair punishment that is proportional to the severity of the offenses. And God's, God's commandment also touch on things like theft, even negligence. Negligence may not be like a crime that people will put you to jail, but uh, in little instant acts of negligence, God also teaches us how do we deal with it? How do we safeguard ourselves from imposing or, or infringe upon the benefits and interests of our neighbors? So God talked about even sexual seduction. How do we avoid that? How, how do we deal with that? And God also talked about this compassionate consideration and care for the needy, for the widow, for the fatherless, for the foreigners. And God talks about how can we make a right and fair restitution. And God doesn't just talk about you know, spiritual stuff and a lot of commandments. God talks about when we really do something wrong, how do we make up for it? How do we make compensation for it? So all the things that I've just mentioned, you can observe that it covers quite a wide spectrum of issues. And so from there, we see that God really wants to be deeply involved in the little details of our life. God wants us to remember, remember him in our every decision, our every action. Now, before we close or complete the covenant code, there's still a few more laws for us to go through. And so that's what we're going to look at today. Today, we will look at a set of laws concerning what? Concerning how to have a blessed rhythm in our life. For what? Why do we need a blessed rhythm? So that we can take time to remember God and to reflect upon how to follow God closely and better. So today we will read from Exodus chapter 23, from verse 10 onwards. Exodus chapter 23, verse 10. For six years you are to sow your fields and harvest the crops, but during the seventh year let the land lie unplowed and unused. Then the poor among your people may get food from it, and the wild animals may eat what is left. Do the same with your vineyard and your olive grove. Now, so from here, we see a first kind of instruction. So from, this, from the verse, we see that the people of Israel, they are commanded to what? To let the land lie unplowed and unused for one year. And in fact, if those of you who know science or people in the agricultural industry, they will know that by doing this, letting the land rest for one year, it is actually a good agricultural practice. Because why? Because it will prevent the exhaustion of the nutrients in the soil. It will restore the land to its fertility. But notice, the Bible didn't tell us that that is the reason why God asked his people to rest the land. God didn't say, oh, rest the land so that the land can restore its fertility. No, God says, what is the purpose for letting the, the land rest? God says that when the land is laid unplowed, that is so that 
the poor and the wild animals can find food to eat. And so that's God's purpose for instructing the Israelites to do that. Why? Because you just think about that. If the Israelites, they didn't work on that field, on their field for one year, then technically speaking, whatever the land produces is none of the Israelites' business, right? Because they didn't contribute any labor to work the ground. So for that one year when they didn't labor the ground, they didn't work the ground, whatever that comes from the ground don't actually belongs to them, whether it's the field or the uh, vineyard or the groove. Everything that come out from the land that one year, that seventh year, is a result of what? It's a result of God's work. It's a result of God's grace. It is God who brought about that produce. I mean, of course, we know. Even from the first year to the sixth years, all the produce also come from God's hand. But on the seventh year, it's more obvious. When the, when the people didn't lay any lay their hand or, produce, uh, or, or, or invest any efforts on the land, whatever come out from the land is due to God's grace. And so what is God doing? God is using that land and the produce from the land to feed the poor and the wild animals. And so that reminds us of a very critical truth. And that is, our God is the provider for all his creation, be it humans or animals. Now, but when you read that law that we read earlier on, you know, about let, letting the land rest on the seventh year, I think a natural question will surely pop into our minds, right? What is the question? Surely people, if you have that uh, business mind or a very livelihood mindset, you will surely think, you know, this entire nation of Israel, they actually survive mainly on agriculture. Now, so if they are commanded to let the land rest for one entire year, then how is the whole nation of people going to survive for that, for that year? So this law, if you know and if you think deeper, this law of the seventh um, Sabbath year for the land to rest, this law is actually designed for a very important purpose. What purpose is that? This law is designed to compel God's people to put their trust solely in God and not on human efforts. And this is something very important. Why? Because if you understand the human nature, although we are not farmers today, but even today, we tend to depend on our human efforts. We rather prefer to depend on ourselves, what we can do, than to think about trusting God and turning to God and asking God for help. But in fact, what is the truth? The truth is everything that we ever have, everything that we can accomplish, everything that we succeed in doing is actually a result of God's grace all along, all along. It's just that, you know, during the seventh year, when the people could no longer work on the land, then it become more obvious. It is not that um, there is no God's grace in the past six years, but when the people are instructed not to do any work on the seventh year, when they cannot do anything themselves, then they are left with no other idea, no other way but to put their faith solely in God and to trust what? Trust that God will provide for them. And not just God will provide, God will provide timely, in time. And not just God will pro provide in time. God will also provide sufficiently. So this is very important for us to also learn even in our today's context. Now, if we refer to uh, Leviticus chapter 25, over there we will read a very interesting uh, verses. Leviticus chapter 25 verse 20. You may ask, and this is one question that's very common to our mind also, right? You may ask, what will we eat in the seventh year if we do not plant or harvest our crops? But look at what God says. I will send you such a blessing in the sixth year that the land will yield enough for three years. And while you plant during the eighth year, you will eat from the old crop and continue to eat from it until the harvest of the ninth year comes in. So, wow, I don't know whether when you read this, don't you think God is very, very amazing? I mean, at, at first, you know, before reading this verse, I thought maybe, yeah, God is gracious. You know, he would just give double the produce on the, in the sixth year. But you just think about it. If you're a farmer, right, you don't just plant and get the crop immediately. You still need to let the crop grow for one whole year, then you can harvest. So God knows. So at first I thought, oh, okay, maybe God give, uh, maybe God give the six years produce, the seven year, and maybe at most up to the eighth year. You know what? During the eighth year, they produce, they they farm, and then they wait until the end of the eighth year they harvest. But God says you can even eat it up to the ninth year, and so that shows us that God is not an unreasonable God. In fact, many a times His mercy, 
His grace, His abundance surprise us beyond our imagination. But the truth is, many a times, indeed, at the first hearing, it does sound to us that God's commandments are a bit hard to obey. Uh, it, it, it sounds a bit difficult to trust and obey God because God's commandment sometimes sounds a bit impractical and counterintuitive. Just like you know the, the commandment to let the, the land rest for seven for the seventh year. Uh, imagine you're the farmer, let the land the land rest for one, one whole year. It sounds like your whole year of life, livelihood is taken away. So many a times, God's commandment sounds counterintuitive, sounds, sounds impractical. And you know, people may think, you know, God, are you kidding? You asked me not to farm for entire one year. What am I and my family going to eat? Just like today, you know, sometimes we ourselves, we may also ask God, you know, certain questions like, God, what do you mean? Are you serious? You are, you're asking me to put down my own efforts and to trust solely in you when I cannot even see you? Or sometimes we question God and we say, God, are you kidding me? Are you sure that I have to go through this tormenting trial? Are you serious that in this suffering, there will be a blessing in disguise? How is it possible that there can be any blessing out of this suffering? It's impossible in human eyes. So sometimes we also question God. But the thing is, through the Bible, God has proven to us again and again that to those people who trust God, God always will provide for them. God will be responsible for, their, for them because they put their trust in God. Now, God, when, when I say God will provide for, for, for His people, I mean, it may not be always the case where God will surely provide His people with whatever we want, with the desired outcome that we want. I mean, of course, if God wants to give us the outcomes we desire, He can do that, of course, because He's God, He can do anything. But the thing is, when God is faithful to provide for us, what I mean is, God will be sure to provide for us the sufficient strength we need to go through our circumstances, be it good or bad. And God will give us sufficient grace so that we will emerge from that trial, being a more mature Christian and even being more contented and joyful in the Lord. So this is God's promise to us. So God will surely take care of whoever puts their trust and faith in God. Now we carry on reading verse 12 from Exodus chapter 23. So six days, do your work. But on the seventh day, so just now we talk about um, Sabbath on a yearly term. The seventh year, let the land rest. Here is Sabbath on a daily, weekly basis. So six days, do your work. But on the seventh day, do not work, so that your ox and your donkey may rest, and so that the slave born in your household and the foreigner living among you may be refreshed. So here, as always, you know, in the, in the Bible, if you notice, there's this trend that God is not just um, dealing with an individual. God is always dealing with a whole community. So when God tells one person, do not work on the seventh day, it is not just impacting that one person. Because God is also telling that person, you must not work so that what? Not that you rest in the Lord, but everything that belongs to you, whether it's the animal, your working animal, your farm animals, or, your, or any person like your slave belonging to you, they also get to rest one day in a week. And from here, from here we know that this is only this principle, to rest one day a week, is only right and humane. It's only right for us to offer those people who work for us one day rest, because we ourselves also need to rest. And so we see this six plus one pattern, six, six days work, one day rest. This six plus one pattern applies not, to the, not just to the land, but also to working humans and animals. And God is not just telling um, Israelites to have a seventh year rest for the land, but also have the seventh day. So it's not just the year, but also the day Sabbath. And so this six plus one pattern, I believe those of you who know the Bible, you know this six plus one pattern originated from Genesis. When God completed his creation work, God rested on the seventh day. And so therefore, if that is the principle institution, instituted by God right from the beginning, that means if today a person works nonstop, Every day a person is working seven days a week, non-stop, without a pattern of rest, that person is not living according to the principle of God because he is not living in the way, in the manner that God has intended for him to. So God 
Again, I said, God wants his people to find rest in him, appropriate rest in him. Of course, not resting every day, don't work and be lazy bum, no. But we need to have a regular and blessed uh, rhythm of rest in the Lord. Now, next, verse 13. Be careful to do everything I have said to you. Do not invoke the names of other gods. Do not let them be heard on your lips. Now, here there is this very important phrase. Do not invoke the names of other gods. Now, this law, or rather I should say the essence of this law. Now, when you read this law, do not invoke the names of other gods. The essence of this law is what? We must only worship the one and only true God exclusively. We can only worship one God. So, in other words, the essence of this law is the chief of all other laws. To only worship one God, that is the chief of all other laws. In fact, do not invoke the names of other gods. It reminds you of the first and second of the first ten of the ten commandments, the first two commandments. So this law, the essence of this law, sort of summarizes all the laws that we have heard earlier on, and it will be the foundation for all future laws that we will get to learn. So in other words, what is the most important thing for a human being to do? That is to worship the one and only true God who created us. There's no other God who created us. There's no other God who created heaven, stars, the earth, and everything we see. There's no other God who creates everything in the universe. So there is only one God, and we must not have idols. That's the essence of today's this, this verse. So if there is no other God, no other, um, no other higher being who, who have the fullest control of our life, if there is no other God who loves us the most, then we must not invoke the names of other gods in, with our mouth. So, in other words, God's people do not need any other God because none of the other gods are as powerful as God, as our Almighty God. In fact, there's no other God. And so, when the Bible says, do not even mention the names of other gods. What does this mean? It's not just saying, oh, you cannot speak the names of idols on our mouth. It means to say what? Do not have anything to do, anything to do with other gods. And so God is trying to tell us, when this is the chief law to focus on the only God, it means that when a person knows how to worship one God, from then on, the person will then know how to abide by God's other commandments, how to love your neighbor, how to handle your money, how to care for the needy, and how to live life in the right way. So the main thing that God demands from human beings, from his people, the main thing that God demands from his people is, is what? Is one thing. Loyalty. Loyalty. And how do you know when how, how, how can you tell whether someone is loyal to, to God? So loyalty can be shown in two ways. What do you think are the two ways? From two ways, you can show loyalty to God. First is by obeying his commandments. And the second is refusing to worship any other God. Now, some people may say, oh, I'm very loyal to God. You know, I only worship one God, our Lord Jesus Christ. But he, he claimed that he only, he's loyal to God. He only uh, worship Jesus Christ, but he never obey any of Jesus' commandments. That is not loyalty. I can profess that I only believe one God, but I never listen to him. I never obey what he tells me to do. That is not loyalty. However, just obeying God's, God's word doesn't mean or doesn't prove one's loyalty to God. Why? Because we see a lot of people nowadays, they have many faiths. You know, they believe in many gods. So while they may obey some of our Lord Jesus Christ's commandments, at the same time, they are also doing what other false gods tells them to do. For example, they may be praying to Jesus, but at the same time, they go to the temple also. And they also, you know, uh, believe in a lot of superstitious things and do a lot of superstitious things. And they say, oh, the more the merrier. I obey God on the one hand. I come to church. I pray to God. But at the same time, I also obey all other false gods. That is not loyalty to the one and only God. And God is not someone who can be fooled by you know, our partial obedience. So loyalty is not, is not just you know, we obey God, but we also at the same time embrace other, 
other so-called gods. But loyalty is what? Loyalty is a person trusts God and God alone. Not just try, try, you know, and, and test out worshipping many, many gods and see which god will grant them their wish. If a person worship God with that kind of try, try, uh, I, I go to every other god in the whole world and I try and see which god give me what I want. If a person worship the true God with that kind of attitude, he is not going to please God. So why did God so often remind us of this chief law? Why? If you read the Bible, the Bible has multiple verses to tell us you must only worship one God. And that is the God of Israel, the God, of, uh, the God who created you and I, the whole universe, the Lord Jesus Christ. Why did the Bible always tell us and remind us to only worship one God? Why? Because his people, not just Israel, but even you and I today, we are so prone to forget this important truth easily. Why? You just think about it. Even for us Christians, when we think and when we find that God is not working fast enough, what do we start to do? We start to find alternatives, right? When we see that God didn't meet our requests, uh, we start to look for other ways. Why? Because if you realize the fundamental issue is our desires are so strong, so strong, meaning to say I am so determined to get what I want. So I must get what I want no matter what. So if this God cannot give it to me, I go and find other God. And so we always have this mindset because our desires are so strong that by hook or by crook, we just want to get what we want. And we can even sacrifice the exclusive worship of the one and only true God. And that is human tendency, and God knows that. And that's why in the Bible, whether it's the Old Testament, the New Testament, you keep seeing God reminding His people, even born-again Christians, we need to be reminded that we must be warned against such human folly and stubbornness to invoke the names of other gods, to turn our hearts to try out other gods. Because the truth is, apart from the true and living God, there is no lasting solution or real happiness awaiting us. But notice when I just saw that verse, verse 13, it's very short. But do you notice something interesting in that verse 13? Every time I ask you, do you notice something interesting in the verse? Again, God's word is not boring, even familiar verses to you. Now, if you look at verse 13, you, you flash uh, verse 13. Anything interesting here? Be careful to do everything I've said to you. Do not invoke the names of other gods. Do not let them be heard on your lips. Notice that God did not merely say, do what I say. God said something very important, be careful. So these two words, be careful, is interesting. Why? It tells a lot. God exposed our heart. God knows our heart. Why did God say, be careful? God is so wise. God is so smart. He sees through our tendency because God knows many a time we are not careful with him. We're very careful with our own interests, our own money. You know, nowadays we make sure people don't scam us. We are very protective of our own interests. We are very careful with things we love. But we are very, very careless with God's words. One year in, one year out. And we don't bother about thinking through concrete ways of how to, how to live out God's word. But you know, if we have our own plan, we will be very careful. You know, we will make sure how our plan actualizes. If I want to, you know, some people that have certain goals to reach certain uh, wealth at, by certain age, they have concrete plans, steps. How do I achieve my dream by age 40? But when it comes to God's laws, they are very, they are not careful. They just treat God's word flippantly. And people tend to treat God's word as what? Optional, you know. Uh, today, if I can hear a word from the church, good. But even if I didn't hear anything from church service today, I will not die. You know, I will still go to school tomorrow. I will still earn my money. I will still get collect my paycheck at the end of the, the month. So a lot of people treat God's word as optional, as mere suggestion, as something they just can consider. And they can decide whether they want to follow or not. But many people didn't treat God's word as the best as the wisest, as the non-negotiable thing for believers to do. So most people, they do not handle God's word and God's command with care. Most people, they did not take God's word to heart. But God is telling us, and today it's not just the words for the Israelites, God is even telling us today, be careful, be careful, because anytime 
we stray away from God's principle and try to go about using our own methods, be careful because that is the moment we will run into trouble. That's the moment we get to unnecessary uh, sorrows, unnecessary issues. So be careful because our heart can wander away so easily. The world catches us so fast. Somebody, a human word, can waver us so easily. And so God tells us, be careful, because if we are not careful, we may incur the wrath of God. We may bring upon discipline and trouble upon ourselves for not living the right way and not choosing a path that is pleasing to God and that will be blessed by God. So, so the thing for us to remember is we need to exercise care every time we hear the word of God because we cannot afford to be careless with the almighty God who has the ability to bless, yes, but he also has the ability to discipline, to punish. So take God's word to heart. Okay, now next, the, ne the next few verses, we will look at certain set of laws concerning some festivals. Now, you're not Jews, so maybe this part you may think it's boring or not relevant to you, but don't jump to conclusion too soon because there's things that can apply to our life. Here, the, 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 the few fest festivals that the Bible listed for us is to help his people, God, to help God's people remember God's providence and grace. So let's read through this and we will ex uh, think about how it applies to us. So for, verse 14, three times a year, you are to celebrate a festival to me. Celebrate the festival of unleavened bread for seven days, eat bread made without yeast, as I commanded you. Do this at the appointed time in the month of Evi, for in that month you came out of Egypt. So God gave some uh, reasoning. Why do you need to observe that festival? Because that month you came out of Egypt. And that's something very life-changing for the Israelites because that was the moment their life turns from being slave to being free. And then um, verse 15 next, No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Now, this is one verse, but one part of the verse later will think through. No one is to appear before me empty-handed. Verse 16, Celebrate the festival of harvest with the first fruits of the crops you sow in your field. And celebrate the festival of ingathering at the end of the year when you gather in your crops from the field. Three times a year, all the men are to appear before the sovereign Lord. Now, if we read later on in Deuteronomy, we will know that it's not just the men who came before the Lord during these kind of festivals. The women and the children are also present. But here, the Bible especially flag out men. Why? Because men, as the heads of families, first of all, they represent the different, different families in Israel. But the heads of the family, they have special responsibility to what? to obey God, to remember God, and to lead their family to follow God closely, to remember God and to obey Him. So the heads of the family have special responsibility. Now verse 18, Do not offer the blood of a sacrifice to me along with anything containing yeast. The fat of my festival offerings must, be, must not be kept until morning. Now, why does the Bible say do not offer blood together with yeast? Uh, we have shared before. Although in the Bible, yeast can have positive and negative meaning, most of the time, yeast refer to something bad, which is corruption. So here, and, and what does blood symbolize? The Bible tells us that blood symbolizes life. So when you offer blood, when you offer life to God, that must not be corrupted, and that must not be defiled by anything that con contains the yeast. And then as for the fats, if you read other portions of the Bible, you will, you will remember that uh, God always tells the Israelites, the fat of the sacrifice. Now, the fat of the sacrifice refers to the best part of the animal, the best part of fats, not the bones, but the fats, belongs exclusively only to God. And so it must be offered to God promptly. It cannot be kept until morning. Why? Because if you keep that best portion up until morning, uh, it's like asking God to wait, you know. Well, God, I, no hurry, you know, just wait. You keep, it's not good to keep God waiting. And another reason is, if you still recall, you know, in the case of the manor, when this manor is kept overnight, it can turn bad and it becomes imperfect. It becomes defective. So we cannot offer to God things that turn bad. 
And importantly, also another reason is if we hold back the best part of the sacrifice and wait until morning to offer to God, what is the human tendency? This is the best part. You keep it, you know, you, you by right should offer to God promptly, you still keep it. We will face the temptation of not giving it to God in the end because it's so, why not we just eat, me and my family just eat up these fats. Don't, don't uh, uh, forget about giving to God in the morning. So it, it, sometimes it applies, you know, even when we want to give our tithes to God, you know, some people by right should give already. The, when you have the payday, I mean, it's not by right or by, it's, it's no law about that. But if you know some people, you give the tithe, the moment you get your pay check versus until the end of the month, by the time end of the month, you feel like, hey, I think I do, this tithe, I better keep for myself, you know, I'm not enough. So sometimes, why God give us reminder through his law? Because he knows the human nature. When we keep and hold back things, we will, our hearts will be tempted. And in verse 19, Bring the best of the first fruits of your soil to the house of the Lord your God. Do not cook a young goat in his mother's milk. Now, a lot of laws may sound a bit strange to us, eh? but here, do not cook a young goat in its mother's milk. That's because back then, uh, surrounding Israel, like in Israel, there are nations, the Canaanites, they are practicing this kind of uh, cult, cultish practices. Uh, they believe that doing this may enhance the fertility of their animals. And God is trying to tell his people, the way you worship me cannot imitate the practices of the pagans. And some people also explain, you know, mother's milk, the goat's mother's milk. Milk is supposed to sustain life. So it is not right to use something which would have sustained life to produce death. Because if you cook it in, the cook the goat in the milk, it is to kill the goat, right? So, Milk is supposed to give life. You're not supposed to use that life-giving things to bring about death. But in any case, the main purpose is not to copy the Canaanite practices. Okay, so here we read about, uh, from the verses that we read just now, it is to highlight one important thing. That is, we need a blessed rhythm of life to remember God weekly and yearly. Notice it's not just yearly. Some people, some Christians, they're very happy. I just come to church on Christmas and Easter. Every year I remember God. I am still a Christian. But it's not just enough to remember God yearly because weekly we also need that rhythm. Why? Why is this blessed rhythm so essential? You ask ourselves. Why? The simple and honest reason is if we are honest enough, we realize that we can get so busy and distracted so easily when we live in this world full of... Now, this world is what? This world is full of what? This earth is full of earthly concerns. That concerns may not be wrong. I mean, it's, we should care about our livelihood. We should worry about our, our exam, whether we can pass or do well. I mean, there are earthly concerns that are legitimate, but nonetheless, there are also concerns. And this world is full of tempting pleasures of sins. Now, just as we want to turn to God, these sins come to lure us. And there's also various distractions that appear to be harmless and trivial, but they actually steal our heart from God. You know, some TV shows, some games, some social media, they are not sin per se, but they are trivial things that easily distract us, that uh, turn our attention away from God, such that we hardly have any heart left for God. And so to help God's people draw near to God and be conscious of His presence. Now, drawing near to God is not a ritualistic thing. Oh, I draw near to God. We draw near to God for what? To be conscious of His presence, of His truth, that God is still reigning, God is still with me, God is not someone to be trifled with, God's commandments are meant to be lived out. We need to be reminded of, of God's presence. We need to be conscious about God and His purpose for us once again, so that, you know, usually what happens when you're conscious of God? Two things. When you're conscious of God, first you feel comforted. Wow, oh, God, I don't have anything to worry because you are with me. Second thing that happens when we are conscious of God is we'll be stirred to obey Him because He is the awesome God. He's the great God. And when we see His glory, we'll be stirred to lay down what is foolish and to obey God. And so God knows it is so important. And so he, he made his people, Israelites, to weave God into their yearly and their weekly schedule. Why did God ask them to keep the Sabbath? And why did God ask them to observe the yearly festival? Because God wants to be weaved into the schedule of his people. 
and people's schedule usually reflects. So for the Israelites, if they faithfully obey God's commandments, it will show and it will reflect God's priority in their life. Likewise for us, you know, our schedule can reflect how important God is in our life. Now, so today, if God is totally absent from our schedule, I believe none of, for, for at least for the people sitting here, God is at least present in our schedule. At least once a week, God is present in our schedule. But, you know, if for certain people, if God is absolutely absent from their schedule, or for some other people, if God is only inserted into our schedule as something optional, or this week I can come, next week I don't feel like it, or raining, then I don't come, or, you know, I... Uh, don't, don't have the mood that I don't come. So if God is inserted into the schedule as something optional or as an afterthought, I have today nobody asked me to go for coffee, nothing to do, okay lah, take MRT, come to church. If God is inserted as an afterthought or if God is really in our schedule already, but if God is something or someone who can be easily dropped out of the schedule, oh, uh, I have a family event, okay, the first thing to drop is not my sleep, not my TV, but God, God has to go first. Now, if God is someone who can be dropped out of the schedule so easily, the first to be dropped out, that shows that God is merely an insignificant part of our life. So, for blessed, no, so when we talk about blessed rhythm, two things we can cover today. Um, of course, there is also the daily one, but today we may not dwell so much on the daily, but we can look at the weekly and the yearly. Now, in terms of blessed weekly rhythm, when we shared about the fourth commandment on keeping the Sabbath, we already spoke about it. So I will not dwell too much into Sabbath keeping. But earlier on, we noticed that the Israelites, they were instructed not to work on which day? On the seventh day, right? And we already covered in our sharing on the Lord's Day that we New Testament believers, we now set aside one day, but it's not on the seventh day. We set aside the Lord's Day, which is today the first day of the week, Sunday. Why? That is to remember the res resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is the most important event because if there's no resurrection, what's the point of our faith? So we set aside one day, and that is the Lord's Day, as New Testament believers to remember the Lord Jesus Christ's resurrection and His grace to us. But in any case, the idea is one day is to be set aside a week for what? to remember God, to worship Him, and not just ritualistically, but to worship God so that we find strength for a new week of work, new week of challenges. And importantly, when we talk about the blessed weekly rhythm, we must not just come to God when we face crises. Now, many people, they faithfully come to God on a blessed rhythm when they are facing crises. But here, when God is giving them this law, it just you do not just apply to their crisis. It applies to normal, normal times, peacetime living. So even in normal times, it is good to set aside one day per week to worship God, to, to, to rest in the Lord. Because you, you'll find the benefit of such consistent practice. Because if you, when we consistently draw near to God, even in peacetime, you realize that it can effectively equip us for what? for future challenges. On the other hand, if a person does not have the blessed habit of worshipping God every week, he may not be prepared, you know, when he suddenly faces troubles. He may not be able to withstand that troubles. He, he, he may even easily stumble. And he can be easily shaken by the slightest problem. It does not need to take a huge problem to topple him. Just a little, little worry can shake him so much if he doesn't observe the weekly blessed schedule of worshipping God. And so God wants us to be in a healthy spiritual state. And so God prompts us, you know, keep it going. Keep the blessed weekly rhythm of resting in God, worshipping God, remembering Him going. And then next, God also plants Himself in the yearly schedule of the Israelites. Now, although, you know, as I mentioned, we are not Jews, we don't need to observe all the festival of ingathering, harvest or whatever, we are not even farmers, but it helps to consider how those festivals actually help the Israelites to remember God better. 
So just now we read about three sacred festivals, and today we will try to understand their significance, so that from understanding their significance, we can draw the application to our life. So we will look at the first festival, festival of unleavened bread. Now, festival can be also um, called feast. So you look at different Bible translations. Sometimes it's called festival, sometimes it's called feast. Because anyway, it's the same. Because during the festival, they will eat. So there will be a feast. So what is so when is this happening for festival of unleavened bread? It usually happens at the beginning of the year. Uh, some say it's around period of March or April. And that is when the first harvest of the year come in, which is the barley. Now, uh, just some back background because we are not farmers. Uh, what I understand is in the agriculture year, especially for the Israelites, you know, different grains have different season of harvest, right? Not every grain harvests at the same time. So barley is usually the first, followed by wheat and other grains. And so the first one to be celebrated is barley harvest. So the purpose of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, there's two main purposes. One is to celebrate and thank God at the first sign of harvest for the year. So the first sign of harvest is the barley. And you know, unleavened bread is made from what? from barley grains. So unleavened bread was made from the newly harvested barley grain and enjoyed as the first reward of their labor. Now, first reward of the crop produced from the, uh, at the beginning of, beginning of the year. That's the first reason. You celebrate the first harvest of the year. Second very important significance of this feast of unleavened bread is as we have gone through the Exodus Account. So, you know, unleavened bread is related to what? To Exodus, the Exodus deliverance and the Passover. So, if you recall, before God put the firstborn of Egyptians to death, before God let the Israelites out of Egypt, the Israelites are commanded to eat unleavened bread. And after that, they also uh, gone through the Passover. So, one important significance of this festival of unleavened bread is to remember God's deliverance. Remember that God redeems. God is our redeemer. Now, no matter what situation you are, you are at right now in your life, doesn't it bring you strength to know that we have a redeemer? Our redeemer is mighty God, loving God. He can save the Israelites out of the fierce Pharaoh. He can save us from our life situation. He can save us even from our eternal curse that relates to sin. So it greatly strengthen us when we remember that we have a God who is our Redeemer. And so unleavened bread, again, uh, unleavened, just as like I mentioned, means no ease, and ease means corruption, so no corruption. So God wants his people to remember that he redeems our life, and because God redeems us, there should not be any traces of corruption in our life. So that's for the festival of unleavened bread. Next, the festival of harvest. Now this I also put other names uh, because sometimes even me myself also got a bit confused by all the different names of the festival. So this festival of harvest in other parts of the Bible is also called the Feast of Weeks or the Pentecost in the New Testament. So this festival of harvest, when did it happen? It happens, it happens seven weeks after the first festival of unleavened bread. And that's why it's called Feast of Weeks because it happened seven weeks later. Or seven weeks can be 50 days after the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And if you don't know what Pentecost means in Greek, Pentecost means 50 years. And that's relating to the, 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 the period where this festival is held, 50 days after the first festival. So it's called Pentecost. And so when does this happen? If you count seven weeks or 50, day, 50 days later, it happens around May or June. And this takes place at the end of the wheat harvest season. So just now we talk about barley, now we talk about wheat. So what is the significance of this festival? It is to remember that God provides. So the people of Israel, they celebrate this feast of weeks to acknowledge that God is the one who supplies them their crop produce. By giving, and so how do they remember God? If you look at the verse just now, they remember God during this festival of harvest by presenting to God, offering to God their first fruits. So they are celebrating God's providence. And with regard to this festival of harvest, another significance is this festival of harvest is 
connected, is linked to the giving of God's law and the confirmation of covenant at Mount Sinai. Okay, if you don't, if you forget already, we mentioned all the laws that we are going through right now is called what? Covenant code. So it's um, part of the book of covenant. But covenant is that, is that relationship between God and his people, right? And covenant code, or, or, or the book of covenant is confirmed in Exodus chapter 24, which we'll come to that later. But whatever the case, why is this harvest of a uh, festival of harvest related to the giving of law at Mount Sinai? It's because people believe that after Israelites came out of Egypt, around this time, around May, June, this time, this was the time where God gave uh, the people the commandments. So this there's this link. So that is for the festival of harvest. I'll go through briefly so that you roughly know, but we don't have to know the details because we are not Israelites. But uh, we need to know the significance. So the third festival is the festival of ingathering, or you can call it the fest, the feast of tabernacles, or the feast of booths. It sounds a bit strange. I'll explain why. Okay, so this takes place in late September or early October, where the final harvest of all the rest of the crops come in in the autumn. Because during winter, usually there's no crops. So autumn is the last of the crops coming in. And what does this festival commemorate? What is the significance? The significance is this festival celebrates God's sustaining providence. I mean, what's the point if God feeds us for one day, for three months, but not for the rest of the year, right? So if you notice the festival, they are, they are quite uh, well spread out throughout the year. One in March, one in May, June, one, one in uh, September, October. And the last festival is to help the people remember that God is a consistent, faithful God. He doesn't just supply us grains in the beginning of the year, in the middle of the year, but God provides us things to eat all the way until the end of the year. God is a faithful, sustaining provider. And that not just remind them of how God provided for them throughout the year. It also reminds future Israelites to recall how God provides for them in the harshest of environment. And that is where? In the wilderness. In the wilderness where there can hardly be food or water. In that 40 years, God faithfully guide his people throughout wilderness. So that is the meaning. And why uh, it can be called Feast of Booth sometimes? Because this is a season of great harvest. So the Israelites have this practice. They will build temporary booth or shelters near their field so that they uh, save time from traveling to their field and to their house because there's so many work to do, right? So overnight, they can also stay around and also watch their crops so that no harm come to their crops. So there's, there's, that's why there's another name, Feast of Booth. So we've very briefly covered the three festivals, but we need to, we need to make sense of these three festivals. These three festivals teach us one important thing that applies even today, and that is it is important for us to remember God. Remember God. Because in the course of our life, you realize in the course of our life, Many things will come our way. Uh, new joys, new, new challenges, new troubles. I mean, at different stages of our life, we encounter new things, right? When I'm a student versus when I'm a working, fresh, fresh working adult versus when I, got, when I got newly married, different joys, different events, different challenges, different troubles come to our life. But no matter what we are encountering, no matter what stage of life we are at right now, we must never forget the most important thing, and that is God's redemptive work and sustaining grace is always in our life. So you can see when we go through all these three festivals, it just keeps reminding the people. God redeems them. God sustains them with continuous grace. So same thing for us. These are the two important things we need to remember. God redeem us, and God will continue to sustain and provide the needed grace in our life, regardless of our situation. And so, even today, God also wants us to uh, have blessed weekly and yearly schedule to, rem to remember Him. Although today we are not locked, so-called, in a set of laws, but things like you know our weekly Sunday service, our weekly cell groups, uh, our monthly prayer meeting, also that monthly prayer meeting, I don't know how many... <laughs> 
So the, the one is coming up next week, so you can pray about coming to the monthly prayer meetings. And our yearly Christian gatherings, you know, like Easter's and Christ, uh, Christmas, these are important schedules for us to, to help us remember the grace of God. Even our daily prayer routine, uh, our daily prayer, some people, you know, you pray every morning, some people you pray every night before you sleep. Now, we must be very careful that sometimes we may think that our daily prayer routine uh, feels very mundane, very habitual, that it's not thrilling and exciting anymore. But we must not think that anything that is mundane or anything that is done habitually is therefore pointless. We must not get into that kind of deception because there are certain things that are habitual but very essential. Things like we eat every day, we shower every day, you know, we freshen ourselves every day, we sleep every day. That is very essential. It may be boring to eat every day. It may be boring to sleep every day. I don't know. It may be boring to shower yourself every day but it's very essential. So who says that things that we repeat every day and habitually are pointless and, and useless? In fact, our daily prayer routine are so important to help us draw near to God despite our busy schedule and not just busy schedule. What's, what's worse? Our busy mind and our busy heart. Many a times, it's not that we are too busy with work. But when we get the time to finally rest and sit down on the couch, our minds and our hearts are so busy with many other things. So God wants us to get into a blessed rhythm so that we can re remember Him and enhance our spiritual health and relationship with God. So when we talk about God telling his, the Israelites to remember, one thing else we need to notice is God does not just tell his people to remember, but also to celebrate. Now in the NIV, every time the festival is mentioned, uh, the word celebrate is there. I mean, of course, different translations use different um, words, but the, the point here is we are not just remembering with our mind. God wants us to celebrate. Now some people they may remember, you know, they may remember, but yet they feel indifferent about it. You know, they may think that nothing great has happened. Um, but celebrate means what? Celebrate means, you no, know, you just think about it. If a person is in a very celebrative mode, huh, it means that they are actually appreciating the grace. When a person celebrates, it means that the person truly feels there's a cause, there's a real cause for joy. So celebration connotes a thanksgiving and joyful attitude. Now, some people, as I mentioned just now, they may remember, but they don't celebrate. Why? Because if you notice nowadays, in fact, there could be Christians around us, we ourselves included. We may remember that we are saved by God. And we know that we are His children. But do we celebrate it? Do we feel joyful and contented? Oh, you know, hey, I'm a child of God. Oh, God re redeems me. I'm saved by God. Do we feel very joyful and thrilled at the thought that God has saved me, saved us, and we belong to Him? Or our hearts are not even thrilled the slightest. Not even one bit of joy when we think about, wow, God, uh, you have saved me. You know, sometimes uh, we, have, we are concerned about different things. Maybe our boss just scolded us and... Just thinking that the boss scolds us and thinking that we are saved by God, this, this salvation by God cannot comfort us for being scolded by our boss. Or you know, at school something happened, our friends uh, didn't support us or whatever, but the thought that God has saved us cannot compensate, cannot cover up, cannot comfort us for other, other things that are not desirable in our life. So we need to ponder. Yes, we remember, we all know God saved us, we belong to God, we are a child of God, but... Are we comforted by the sacrifice of Christ on the cross? Or we just take it for granted? You know, do we feel, uh, do we have this thought sometimes? You know, okay, I'm a Christian now, but so what? I mean, how many, how many of you secretly think about this? Oh yeah, I, I know I'm a Christian, but so what? I still have a lot of uh, unhappiness. I still have a lot of uh, things I don't like. We need to really ask our heart. When life troubles hit us, or when things that are not so desirable happening happen in our life, can we still find any cause to celebrate God's grace, even if there are certain aspects of life that is not so pleasing to us? And so God wants us not just to remember, 
But God is telling us there's indeed a cause for celebrate because the gift that He has given us, the grace that He has given us, far supersedes any other earthly pleasures and grace or blessing that we can receive. And now if we remember, if we are grateful to the point that we can celebrate with joy, then what's the next thing? Now, so through all this festival, God wants His people to remember, right? To celebrate, to, be, to find a cause for joy. So now, okay, we remember and we are joyful and we celebrate. So what's next? What's the natural response? If a person is really grateful to God's grace, naturally he will want to offer something to God, right? Offer a sacrifice. So you notice in all this festival, sacrifice is always something essential. But God is not telling his people to sacrifice or bring him sacrifice with a transactional mindset. Oh God, you know I give you this sacrifice, so you must give me what I want. Or God is not telling his people to sacrifice to him in exchange for something. Oh God, I bring you this sacrifice, now you must save me. No. We all know our salvation cannot be bought with any of our sacrifice. But when God tells his, pe tell his, tells his people to remember his grace, to celebrate with joy, and to bring him a, of an offering, God is telling his people that that offering should be a response to God's grace, not as an exchange to demand from God to do things that we want. So the offering is being brought to God with a grateful heart. And if you recall just now verse 15, it tells us what? No one is to appear before God empty-handed. No one is to appear before God empty-handed. Now, in the past, I always feel very, when I was very young, I always feel very stressed when I read this kind of verse. Well, no one is to appear before God empty-handed. But no matter what, this is good reminder because, because God is not money-minded. I mean, of course, God doesn't need our money. Our money cannot buy God his palace or whatever. Our money cannot do much. God can do everything. But when we come before God ill-prepared, it reflects a lot on the weight of God in our heart. Now, you just think about it. Sometimes I think if I go to some potluck, uh, potluck session, I'll feel so embarrassed if I don't bring anything and happily, hey, you know, uh, let's have a feast, but I didn't bring anything to the potluck. I'll feel so paisay. I'll feel so embarrassed. So why do we think it's all right to come before this almighty God who has given us his life, his, his blood, his precious son, and we, and we think, oh, it's fine to come before God empty-handed. It's not that... It's not as if, you know, our gift can do anything to God, but it reflects our heart toward God. And it's not just about bringing monetary offering. What God really desires more is what? Have we prepared our heart of worship to God? When we come before God, are we willing to offer our life as living sacrifices? Because after all, what is easier to give? To give God $1,000 is easier or to give God our life as a living sacrifice. If you're honest, giving money is easier. Giving life is so difficult. So God wants us to think through. When we come before Him to celebrate with joy and thanksgiving, what is it that we are bringing before Him? What, is living, what does living sacrifices even mean? Do we even know what does living sacrifices mean? It means you know, letting God use everything He has given us. It could be my money, it could be my talent, it could be my time. And it may make me inconvenient, it may not be suiting to my preference, but allowing God to use what He has given us. That is living sacrifice. God wants us to offer every aspect of our life to Him out of gratitude and joy. And so this is why God wants His people to celebrate the festival. Not just because it's some ritual and everybody have fun and have a feast. But today, again I say, even though we are not Jews, who need to literally observe all this Jewish festival, we need to appreciate that God's essence, the essence of God's law still apply to us today. Because if we acknowledge that even today, we can be easily distracted, we are so busy with many other things beside God, then we will understand why God emphasized so much for us to seek out a blessed rhythm in our life to remember God better. And so God, again I say, so each of us has to pray through. Of course, we have our church, usually Christian circle, we have this weekly worship service to help Christians get into this blessed rhythm. But on a personal basis, all of you, all of us need to think through how can we pray for a blessed rhythm in our life so that we will not be so easily 
our attention will not be so easily stolen away from fixing on God. And not just remember God. Today, God tells us He wants us not, not just to remember Him, but to celebrate Him because His redemption is indeed cause for our joy. Even if we, we may be facing challenges, but when we think about the joy of salvation, like Samis mentioned, the joy of salvation should be enough to strengthen our heart. And importantly, when God tells us to remember Him and to rest in Him, one very important thing is, what is God trying to tell us? God is trying to tell us to rest from human efforts and trust solely in Him. Just like when He say, don't plant, don't plow, don't work the land on the seventh year and I will feed you. Sometimes God asks us to rest from our human determination, our human ways that always fail so that we turn to put our trust in Him. So with this, I pray that as we go through the laws of God, we will start to appreciate God's law and we'll start to see the benefit of obeying God's law and we'll find the heart to want to live out God's law. And with that, let's go to God in prayer. Dear Lord, we want to thank you for giving us your word. And Lord, we thank you for helping us understand that even though we are not Jews of the Old Testament, but even your Old Testament commandments can relate to our life today. So Lord, we pray that you really help us to be careful, to be careful to take your word to heart, to be careful to want to live out your word and live in the way of your word and not to deviate from your word, from your principle. So God, help us because our heart are so prone to wonder, to disbelief. But today as we hear your word, we pray that you help us be careful and you give us the strength to obey you. And God, most importantly, please work in our heart to remind us of your grace and not just be reminded as a knowledge, but when we remember your grace, Lord, please stir our heart into joy and into loving you as well. Lord, we thank you and we pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Thank you.